Because of a virus that attacked and hurt the world, we put much emphasis on washing our hands. But I'm here to tell you that there is a spiritual virus and it is attacking marriages, families, and young adults. And it's called impurities. In 2020, the world asked us to wash our hands, but God is also calling us to have clean hearts. The word purity means freedom from contamination. And in this book, we address things that contaminate our heart, such as lust, unforgiveness, bitterness, insecurities, idolatry, pornography, amongst other contaminations, and how to get free from them. And that's exactly why we wrote this book, A Call to Purity, because God is calling us to be pure. You see, when you walk in purity, you walk in freedom. And friends, this book is just not a book. It's a mandate from God, and God is calling us to rise up and walk in purity. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning into the Let's Talk Purity podcast with Brittany and Richard Delamora. We're so excited that you guys are here. As always, this podcast is brought to you by edify.app, so make sure you download the app to check out all of the incredible Christian podcasts. Please leave us a five-star review if you're tuning in on Apple. Comment Come below on. if you're watching on YouTube. And you probably do want to head over to YouTube today because today we are interviewing um, a powerful, anointed man of God, Sathaya, and he has an incredible story. And he is doing amazing things to help men with porn addictions. And so today we're going to share his story and introduce you to our friend, Sathaya. Sathaya, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Brittany. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and Richard as well. I just got to interview you guys on my podcast. It was lots of fun. So hey, it's fun to on. do this now. I know. So now we're excited to interview you. Um, so could you just for for those who don't know your story, could you share like with your history with porn, how you started watching porn, how you're exposed to it and how you stopped watching? Yeah, so I'm technically a fourth generation pastor. Mm -hmm. So that means my dad, grandpa and great grandpa were all pastors. And uh, I say that to, to say that I grew up in a very Christian home. Uh, you know, mom and dad were the same people off the stage they were on the stage, like no funny business, just a good, safe home. Uh, they even forked out the money for us to go to a private Christian school. Mm -hmm. And it was in the computer lab of that Christian school where I first got exposed to pornography. So um, I was 11 wow. years old. This was like 2001, guys. So this is uh, before like broadband internet and smartphones and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that was, that was just the beginning. It wasn't like I was addicted overnight. It just kind of planted a seed. And when I hit puberty and started to develop more sexually, I had that in the back of my mind and just slowly start to go back to it more regularly. Yeah. By the time I was in university, I was pretty dependent on porn and I would actually plan my days around it. I was like studying to become a psychiatrist. So working super hard. Uh, I had like four figures in research grants. So I was like working in the labs and just doing all like all kinds of stuff just to keep myself busy. But at the end of the day, usually I would watch porn to relieve myself from all the stress and to reward myself for the hard work that I was doing. And those things could together kind of developed this dependency on it, this addiction. In the middle of my education is where I also gave my life to God. Uh, not that I didn't know God before, but it's where I kind of made the commitment. And with that, I knew I had to get rid of porn and kind of my sexual misbehavior. And I could not for the life of me figure it out. I just, I tried all kinds of stuff. You know, I installed internet filters and I confessed and I prayed more. And you know, like I was doing all the things that I saw other people doing and it was getting me no results. And I, I think that was when I realized like either I've been lied to or something is horribly wrong with me, but I was, I was pretty convinced there was just more to the equation. And eventually I started to identify what some of those things were. And that's when I really started to make progress. So February 2016, that was when I had my last relapse, uh, kind of the last time I, it was ever a problem. And, um, and I, I kind of just enjoyed that victory for a season of my life before I got married and then felt kind of permission from the Lord to, to launch Deep Clean and help other guys as well. Yeah, so amazing. Good. Could you tell us? Well, first off, okay, I want to know, like when you were watching porn, was that also a way for you to like practice sexual purity? Because we get that a lot, like where men say like, well, I'm single and I'm trying to honor God with my body. So I just watch porn versus 
going out and having sex. Yeah, I've heard that as well. I, I was not in that camp myself. I think I had a, a very deep conviction about it. But for me, I had just always told myself I could stop when I need to. Like I'll stop when I have a serious career or when I get married or whatever. So no, I, I, I don't think I really justified it from a, a moral standpoint. I knew there was something wrong about it, but I more just justified it. Oh, in this season, it should be okay. And I'll, I'll get rid of it when I really need to. That's beautiful. So Thaya, how did you, like, how did you know? Now, when you were watching porn, like, this is a big problem now. Like, did you ever have that moment where it's just like, okay, this has gone too far? Yeah, actually, I, I did. I, I remember it quite fondly. So uh, the pinnacle of my struggle was I was still living at my parents' place. I was studying uh, at university. And I was living, uh, because I was living with my parents, my younger brother was there as well. Uh -huh. And I lived in the basement. And we only had one... I guess I had my own personal laptop, but anyways, we had like a personal computer for the family and that was also in the basement. So it was in this office and it had a pull out couch and my brother was sleeping in the office in the summer because it was really hot in his bedroom, which was upstairs. And I just remember the one day, like the urges were super strong and I was like, oh crap, I know my brother's in the room. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And I literally just paced back and forth like, oh, I think I'm just going to do, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, like just going back and forth. And I eventually caved in and, you know, I was kind of like looking over my shoulder while he's sleeping in the pullout couch because um, I didn't want to scar him, you know, like just the horrible irony and hypocrisy in one moment. <laughs> um, but that was when I knew like, dang, like, look at the risk I just took for what, like for a little 10 minute quick hit of porn. Um, so that's when I really knew I had a problem. And I think the other moment I had was when I, I had made that decision. It's like, OK, God, you have my whole life, everything I'm, I'm living for you. I'm not going to watch porn anymore. And I, I really felt um, like something had changed. Like in me, I had this desire and I, I wanted it and I was serious about God. And I was like, nothing can stop me now. And I think it was only like two or three days later I was watching again. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that was such a quick turnaround. Like this was way worse than I realized. So those were the two moments for me where I was like, this is, this is bad. Um, as a pastor, did you open up to anybody or like, did you or... Yeah, I did. So when I was in ministry school, I opened up to the director of my school, which was really scary. I was an intern at the time and I actually thought he might kick me out. And he was super gracious and super loving. And he's like, bro, he's like every guy like in this school watches porn, like or has struggled with porn at some point, like you're OK. Um, and then when I was actually like pastoring, like an assistant pastor, I opened up to my senior leader about it as well. And they, they were a very loving, forgiving environment. Like there wasn't a, tons of fear as far as my job security goes, but I was scared about what they were going to think about me and that kind of thing. But he was, again, really supportive. So you stopped watching porn in 2016. And when did you get married? I got married September 2019. Okay. So what did that next like three year journey look like for you of like, now I'm done with porn. Like, how did you... Um, how did you conquer urges? Like what did all of that, what did that process look like for you? Yeah. So I had this prayer when I was, I, it took me about three to five years to really experience full freedom, I would say. Okay. And one of my prayers, cause I was single at the time. One of my prayers was God, whoever my future spouse is just keep her on hold. Cause one of my mentors taught me that marriage is a magnifier. Yeah. And he said, bro, if you think marriage is going to fix your problem, you're sorely mistaken. It's going to make absolutely, it much, much worse. Absolutely. And I didn't, I honestly did not have the foresight to know that, but I trusted him enough to believe what he was saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I prayed that prayer, whoever she is, just keep her over there while I kind of get my stuff together. February, 2016, I had my last relapse. November, 2016 is when I met Shaloma. And, um, and so it, it, there wasn't a huge gap in between, yeah. but I, I think God knew that, that the work was done, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, and the, the thing for me was just having a lot of conversations up front about my past and about my desires in the relationship. So I had gone into dating knowing that the next person I kissed, I wanted to be my wife so yeah. much so that I did not want to kiss while we were dating because yeah. I had messed that up in the past. Like as soon as things got physical, it was just hard for it to not become very sexual quickly. Yeah. And I really didn't like that. I knew it was a huge mistake. And the only way I could think that I would be able to cope with some of my bad habits was like, let's just put that off the table while we get to know each other. So, um, my wife had made the same promise to God completely separately. So we were both terrified to have that conversation with each other. And then we're like equally relieved when we found out, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Like we're actually on the same page about it. I love that. Um, and then when we got in.
gauge, like we did start kissing and we had to have just a lot of conversations about what we were going to do, like not hanging out together alone. Um, or like if, if you were going to go, if you were going to watch some TV together, like not lying down, sitting up, like really practical little things, some accountability. And then something I learned uh, along the way as well. And, and granted, by the time we were engaged, I had been clean for a couple of years, but, um, being proactive in the conversation is really helpful. Yes. And I, and I think guys often just wait until after the fact, and it's so much, so much worse. And I, I remember one time. I had a particularly tough day at work. I I forget exactly what happened and we were having a date that night and all I could think about that day was how could I watch porn? Like that, that part of my brain was just really triggered and it had been a while and you know, I was at work, I wasn't doing anything, but the the thoughts were there. And so I go to pick her up and I was thinking maybe once I got out of work, the work environment, it would dissipate, but that wasn't the case. So we picked her up, go back to my place and I started to get really concerned that like if I, if something didn't happen or if I didn't do something or say something, something bad was going to happen. And up until this point, I hadn't mentioned anything. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to, I need to tell her, of course, like I was bottling it all in. So she was just getting out of the car as we pulled into my driveway. I was like, Hey babe, I just need to tell you something. And, uh, and I was like, I don't know why, but I've just felt really triggered today. And I'm really concerned that I'm going to push our boundaries too far tonight. Can we go to a restaurant instead or like something, you know? And she just had a smile on her face. She's like, thanks so much for telling me. I'll pick up the slack a little bit tonight. And just telling her that in of itself did all the work. Like it just, it took the pressure off. It was out in the open. And I learned that it's actually much better to confess a temptation than confess a mistake. Yeah. I have have requoted you on that so many times. Oh, Oh, good. At the forefront of my mind, such a powerful quote. Say that one more time just for everybody listening. Yeah, I would rather confess a temptation than confess a mistake. Come on, that's and um, and so those are some of the things that I think really helped us leading up to marriage. You know, kind of recovering from the past. That's so good. You know, Sathai, you know, in your past, you kind of done it wrong, right? While watching porn and seeing all these fantasies and all these, you know, false imagery, right? That maybe could have affected the purity of your heart, but then you know, you really had this like pinnacle moment, your life changed, you're restored now. And now you had this, you know, beautiful woman. Um, For those who are listening, um, some people might be like, well, I don't understand like the power and the beauty of like sexual purity. What do you think that did for you and your wife? Like what was the benefits of sexual purity for you two as you guys were on your journey with dating relationships and now being married? Yeah, that's such a good question because all I really heard growing up was porn is bad and don't have sex before marriage. And yeah. there's actually very little beauty in that kind of rigid yeah. rules, yeah. right? Like how do you really enjoy sexuality with those kinds of parameters? For me, I can say by far the best thing was just the de-shaming experience that I went through. Mm-hmm. Like right. that's the best part about purity is when it's done correctly, you are actually walking just confidently in your sexuality in the, in the sexual being God's made you to be yeah. and not having that shame, having the confidence about it. To me, that's really beautiful. And the other thing that was really pivotal for me was like building that intimate relationship with God. Come on. And I think, I think it's like, it's the plumb line of purity yeah. is that we, we actually start to like get to know him. He starts to get to know us. And in the process we get, we become more like him. And I think that's the, it's the fast track to purity is just building intimacy with God. Right. And I think, I think people, people miss that part. Like they think it's all about the behavior when actually the behavior is just the byproduct. But if you do it right, you focus on the relationship first. Can I just, can I drive this home a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. You preach it, man. Go keep going. Okay. Okay. So you guys know I'm living in Jamaica right now. Right. And um, that's because my wife is Jamaican. So uh, my wife has actually, she lived in Canada for like 10, 11 years now. And if you got to know her and you start talking to her, you wouldn't really guess that she's Jamaican. Like it's not very obvious. She just kind of turns it on when she needs to. The only exception is when she's driving. So I don't know what it is about like road rage or bad drivers, but like her patois and her slang and it all comes out, man. Her little inner Jamaican is what I like to call it. And, um, and I used to just chuckle at her, you know, like Shaloma, what are you doing? And, um, and then one day I was on the road and my inner Jamaican came out, you know, like this guy just, cut me off. You kind of upset me. And I'm like patois slang and everything. And I'm like, where did all this come from? And I'm like, oh, duh, it came from Shaloma. 
because yeah. I spent all this time with her. I've been around her all the time. I've started to pick up parts of her. Yeah. And that's the incredible part about intimacy is, uh, and, and purity is like, it's not, it's not a goal that you achieve. It's something you become. Yes. And as you spend you that go. time with God, you just naturally become more like him. That is, that's the collateral reward of intimacy. That's what I talk about in my book. And, um, and I think people are missing it if they're just trying to like white knuckle it through and not have sex before they get married or whatever. It's just about enjoying that intimacy with him and, and the lack of shame that comes in that approach. Come on. Let's talk about your book, The Last Relapse, because you just talked about it. My question sure. is, why did you call it The Last Relapse? So I, I wanted to give hope. Like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like a teacher at heart, so I have lots of frameworks and structures and analogies and all that kind of stuff. But my, one of my marketers said, like, she's like, look, you're not giving people information. You're not giving them a program. You're giving them hope. Like, that's what people need. And I was like, that's true, actually. When I was struggling, you know, I struggled for 15 years. And every day you just wake up hoping, God, I hope, I hope today I stay clean. You know, like anything I can take that's going to help me. So for me, I, I wanted to give something that was hopeful. Yeah. And I think a lot of people do wonder, like, if they can ever actually get free of porn. Yeah. And uh, I think we're all living examples that, yes, you absolutely can. Everybody on planet Earth can have their last relapse yeah. um, if they have the right help, the right support, the right, um, you know, the right things in place. So that's why I called it that way. And the other thing is, like, we're, we're really confident in the system that we have developed. It's really... Um, it's almost doing it a disservice to call it a, a system. It's really a revelation that God had given me. Yes. And, and so we're really confident if people can put these things into, into practice and really exercise them that they are going to eventually have their last relapse. I love it. And so would your book, do you think that it would be, um, would you recommend it for both men and women? Or is this like, who's your target audience here? Sorry, guys. Did it cut out? Um, yeah, did, yeah, it did cut out. Did you just ask if it was uh, recommended for men or for women? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so it, it was definitely let written ask, for... Hold on, let me ask a question just in case it didn't record that. And then that way we oh, have... Absolutely. So for your book, is it um, targeted towards men, women? Like, who's your target audience? Yeah, so it was definitely written for men. Uh, that's who I work with primarily. But it's very principally based. Uh, there's a lot of Bible and research in it. So... Anybody can read it and, and benefit from it, but it does target men. Okay. And now I love your program, Deep Clean. Mm. I love seeing on Instagram, just all the men that you're helping. I'm so inspired by that. Can you tell us about your uh, program, Deep Clean? Also, where can people um, find your program and where can people buy your book as well? Sure. So the premise of Deep Clean is that all behavior is rooted in belief. Yeah. And a lot of people make the mistake of trying to tackle any kind of sexual misbehavior by modifying the behavior instead of trying to transform the heart. Yeah, I, so good, good, we, good. we've developed an approach that helps people do that, you know, in kind of a practical way. So we have three pillars okay. of the recovery process and each pillar has a mantra. Yeah. The first pillar is self-awareness. And the mantra there is if, it, if you're not aware, it cannot be repaired. I love that. So just plain and simple, if you don't actually understand what's going on within you, the, the yeah. triggers, uh, maybe the traumas from the past, the things that are actually driving you to the misbehavior, you have no chance of healing it long term. Yeah, yeah. The second pillar is healing. And one of my mentors was the one who taught me this mantra. He said, he who is most vulnerable heals the quickest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what we really encourage people is to, to be real about the parts of their past, the hurts in their life, the things that maybe have built up over time, the resentment, bitterness, all that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And that leads into the third pillar, which is identity. And our mantra there is, I would rather be 100% my true self and rejected than 80% my true self and accepted. Yeah. That's so good. And it's teaching guys to be the person God made them to be yes. with bold authenticity. Okay. And it takes time to get there and um, it, it's a work, but when you really make that progress, it is amazing. The behaviors do start to take care of themselves. And we wrap all of it with community. So we try to like, plug people into uh, groups of guys around the world who are pursuing freedom just like them. So that's the Deep Clean program and what it looks like. Uh, they can find out more about it at getadeepclean.com. That's the website. Uh, nice and easy to remember, a little bit easier than spelling my name. And the book is called The Last Relapse. It's available on all major platforms as well.
Let's awesome. go. Come on. Well, friends, family, you guys, <laughs> you need to check out Sathaya's book. It is called The Last Relapse. Head over to Amazon, wherever. It is available everywhere. And check out his Deep Clean program, man. I think that it's just going to be so powerful to your life. Um, and you can get that at getadeepclean.com. Let's go. Thank you so much for tuning into the Let's Talk Purity podcast with Brittany and Richard Delamora. And we will see you guys next time. We love you so much.